Jeremy, thank you for being here. Right, thank you for having me. So why does 2024 represent an important year for crypto? Right, this is the year that we've been waiting for for many years. Um, you know, when, when crypto first started, it was nerds and geeks and a few underground people, you know, doing programming for each other and one guy selling pizzas. Um, but in 2024, we've had BlackRock, we've had Fidelity, we've had Wisdom Tree, we've had ARK Invest. There's literally companies with $10 trillion on Wall Street who are going, I'm going to buy crypto. So it's really legitimized the industry that people said, oh, you know, it's just for nerds, it's just for geeks, oh, it's for drug dealers, it's for criminals. But no, it's actually for fundamental investment by trillion dollar companies. Mm. So yeah, this, this year has started off with a big bang. Um, where the, the SEC actually lost in court because the SEC has been trying to stop these Wall Street guys from getting into crypto, um, and they couldn't because, they, you know, that the SEC basically didn't have a case. So, you know, we, we've been running our business. This is our ninth year in business, and most of the time we're contacting people and saying, hey, would you like to invest a little bit of your money in crypto? You've already got stocks and shares and whatever. But... You know, since the 10th of January, we've been having phone calls. We've had people knocking on the door saying, hey, can I give you my money? Because I've noticed that Wall Street's in crypto now. So crypto must be decent. You know? Right, so it's right. It's very exciting. So why is, you know, BlackRock investing in crypto that significant? Because most people would think that if BlackRock's getting involved, it becomes a problem. So maybe if we can take a step back, what, what were the, the phases of crypto beforehand? And why is this phase in particular just the, the biggest thing? Uh, the phases of crypto, as I say, it was, was sort of nerds and geeks and programmers to begin with um, mm. because there was no advertising campaign. You know, it was just the person who created it telling a few people who told a few people who told a few people. And they were just using Bitcoin to pay each other for doing favors. Like I've written half a program, can you write the other half or supply the graphics or whatever? So it was just this little, you know, nerd money that, that the computer programmers swapped around. Um, but then after a while, there was other people who started to look at it as a, as a payment method. Because if I wanted to send you $1,000 right now, um, well, let, let's say it's Friday afternoon, I want to send you $1,000 and the bank's going to be shut for the next two days. And if I get that money, it's going to leave my account now, but you won't receive it until Monday. And what if Monday is a bank holiday or something like that? But because Bitcoin runs 24-7 on the internet and is like the internet, can't be stopped, can't be censored, unlike the banks who can reverse a transaction if they don't like it, uh, people start to realize this is great as a payment system. And I started using Bitcoin as a payment system back in 2014, 2015. Um, to pay some of our subcontractors, like paying guys on Fiverr and things like that to do stuff for our business. Because to send $1,000 through the banking system would cost me $20 or $30. Uh, sending it through Western Union to a third world country would cost $70. And sending $1,000 on the Bitcoin network would cost 50 cents. Mm -hmm. So we started using it as a payment system without realizing it's actually a store of value because there's only 21 million Bitcoin. It's like there's only so many tons of gold, there's only so many tons of silver. And as many people know, when, when the stock market goes to hell, which it does, there's a crash every seven to 10 years. You know, gold and silver go up in value because they're a scarce commodity. They're like a, a safe haven uh, when the stock market or the property market are not going so well. When there's a war on, people tend to hoard gold. Um, and Bitcoin is actually scarcer than gold because there's gold out there in the, in the atmosphere on, on asteroids and things like that. You know, there's gold on other planets. There's no Bitcoin on other planets. And every few years, Bitcoin becomes rarer and rarer and rarer. So it's, it's a fun thing. Like if you, wanted to, if you wanted to travel to another country and take your life savings with you, let's say you've got you know, $300,000 worth of gold bullion. It's very heavy, right? And it's going to set off the metal detectors and that sort of stuff. You're going to need an armed guard to travel with you. But you could literally have a million dollars in Bitcoin stored on a little USB device or stored on your phone. You know, so it's much easier to transport, it's much easier to store, and it is one of those safe haven assets. A lot of people call Bitcoin digital gold for that reason, because it's safe, it's scarce, and it increases in value over time, whereas most things decrease in value over time. What about some drawbacks to Bitcoin? You know, I'd love to get into all the pros, but do any of these drawbacks about energy, pollution, 
you know, some people talk about supply chain centralization. Do any of these things have merit? Um, they do if you take them out of context. Hmm. So, you know, there's, there's Bitcoin miners, which are basically the guys who are keeping the thing in operation. Now, now you and I are using the internet. So between you and me, there might be 10,000 computers that are all connected by the phone lines and all those computers are turned on and there's the Amazon web service. Now, none of us are complaining that all of these computers turned on using up energy because we want to use the internet, right? And no one complains that the banking system is using up so much power because you want to tap and go with your Visa card. But in between you and the bank, there's a thousand little things and there's businesses that with their lights on that are processing the transactions and things like that. So, yes, it's true that the Bitcoin network uses more power than New Zealand. Mm. But New Zealand's a tiny little country with three million people. Right, so you've got to compare Bitcoin to the global Visa network or the Mastercard network or the Bank of America or something like that, um, because it is a payment system. It's not a tiny little country in the South Pacific. Right. So when you compare Bitcoin to the legacy banking systems, it uses a fraction of the power. But these these are the, the stories being spread by the, the the bank loyalists who hate anything new coming in, because obviously Bitcoin is a threat to the banks. And even you know, people who are watching this might have noticed in the last two, three, four years, banks are closing down their branches. They're reducing their services. And because more people are going online, more people are using digital currency. Uh, there's so many things I want to say, but I guess looking at it from a super broad perspective, why is Bitcoin disrupting banks? It feels like a lot of people are talking about cryptocurrency and the future is crypto but not a lot of people are talking about why and especially for gen z i think they're yeah. interacting with cryptocurrency not necessarily with the ideas but just to trade so if you could just you know interact with those ideas for a second why is cryptocurrency this you know incredible innovation and revolution for banking and, and being your own bank I mean, I've, I've got a couple more grey hairs than you and most of your audience. So I can, I can remember the days when there was no internet, yeah. you know, when I would literally, if I wanted to send you a photo of my dog, I had to put it in an envelope and mail it to you. It took three or four days to get there. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to send you money, again, I'd wire it through the banking system. It would take three or four days. Um, and if I wanted to talk to my sister who lived in America and I was in Australia, I would write down a note on a fax and I'd press it on the fax and send it. And I'd send the fax at midnight because an international call was so expensive. I couldn't call my sister. It was too expensive. It was like $5 a minute. This sounds so, like a different planet. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. It was like the old days, like the Stone Age, you know, riding, riding horses to school and dinosaurs. But, you know, these days you, you don't even realize you're not connecting your computer to the internet. You're not doing the dial up and plugging it in and getting everyone off the phone. Like you just pick up your phone and you say, hey, Google, what's the weather like tomorrow? Or, mm. you know, how many beans in a kilogram? whatever, all of the answers to everything are at your fingertips. And people are using the technology without realizing, oh, I'm using the internet. There's thousands of little computers connected up together. You, it's like you don't understand how your car works, you just get in the car and drive, mm -hmm. right? You don't look under the bonnet most of the time. So for, for digital currency, it's just new evolution. The legacy banking system, like why does it take three days for my payment to get to you? The answer is because in the olden days, they would have a bike messenger going from one bank to the other, you know, taking the check down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and people got used to it, always took three days. Yep. And then when the banks started hooking up to computer systems in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, they realized they could do the transaction instantly, but they didn't tell people because if they held onto the money for three days, they could get interest for those three days. And three days isn't a lot of time and it's not a lot of interest, but when you're talking hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, the banks are making an absolute premium by doing still doing three-day settlement. And it's only after Bitcoin started to get popularized in you know, 2016, 2017, that the banks actually came out and went, oh, oh, we've got a new system. We can, we can do Fed now. We can do Oscar. We, we can do it instantly as well because they were feeling threatened. So it's, I, I guess the postal service was threatened by email. It's mm. hard to send a letter to someone now. It's mostly just you know, parcels and couriers. And the banking system is really threatened by Bitcoin and digital currency, which is great because it forces them to innovate to get better. And maybe they'll compete, maybe they'll disappear. I don't know. 
So going back to what you were saying about it being decentralized, it's deflationary, it's a store of value in particular. So you put your money in there and the purpose is that when these turbulent times come, maybe it's a war, maybe it's a stock market crash, your assets are safe. So Mm -hmm. should Gen Z invest in only Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies? Do other cryptocurrencies have the same um, fundamentals as Bitcoin or is it not that is that not the case? Uh, when when I first looked, like Bitcoin, I just used as a payment system. I didn't realize it was digital gold until much later. Um, and Ethereum came out in like 2015, 2016. And then people started to build um, lots of other things on top of Ethereum. So when Ethereum came out, it was like the internet was invented. And then all of a sudden, all the websites and all the web pages and all the apps start coming out. And all of a sudden, there was thousands and thousands of these different coin projects. And because I've got, you know, 20, 30 years experience in the stock market, I sort of looked at all these little projects and went, oh, this is just like a little stock market. You know, all these people making these applications. And I can choose to invest in them or I can choose to not. Now, Bitcoin is great for what it does. Like gold is a great thing for what it does. You know, gold has been a staple of human investment and currency for 7,000 years or more. Um, But it doesn't do everything. So, you know, there's, there's other different applications out there, and I don't want to, I don't want to name any. Um, but you know, I've, I've already mentioned Ethereum. So Ethereum is actually an inflationary currency because they can print more. So next year, there'll be 4% more Ethereum than there is right now. Whereas, you know, you can't make any more Bitcoin, like you can't make any more gold. Um, you know, companies like Tesla and Apple and, and Amazon, they can print new stocks if they want to raise more money. And some of these some of these cryptocurrencies can print more, and some can't. And some of them actually run applications like we've we've seen the NFTs and the crypto kitties and the digital artworks and things like that um, that are more common on Polygon, more common on Solana, more common on Ethereum. Um, they've only just started with the ordinals, you know, putting little pictures on pictures on Bitcoin. So it's, it's different things for different purposes. I, I wouldn't suggest anybody put all their life savings into one stock, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's Amazon or Tesla or whatever. It's always diversifying because every now and then, you know, a Tesla might run over a person or a, or a plane might crash into a building. And if you're only holding one stock, then all your money's gone. But if you're holding 20 or 30 stocks, if one goes down, it's not going to hurt you so much. So we, we diversify in our cryptocurrency fund, like there's 30, 40 coins that we hold at any one time. We also hold stocks like technology stocks that run the fiber optic networks and things like that. Um, so diversifying makes sure that whatever happens isn't going to hurt you too badly. And that's what I suggest to people. Have, you, know, you can have a look at different, um, different cryptocurrencies, see what they do. It depends what you're into. Because some people are computer programmers. They'll be able to understand this one on a level that I don't understand it. And you know, it depends what you're into is, is what your favorite stock is going to be, what your favorite crypto is going to be. How did you get into this? Like, how did you get, what's your background and how did you get started on this journey? Uh, my, my background is, yeah, I, I started financial planning when I was 19. Um, so I, I wanted to have a lot of money when I was a kid, as most 19 year olds want to have a fast car and a big house and that sort of stuff. Yep. Uh, and, and someone said to me, one of my mentors said to me, you know, if you're selling cars or selling houses, people will reach a critical point. Once someone's bought four or five houses from you or four or five cars from you, they're, they're full. Um, but if you're working directly with investing and working with money, the guy who's a millionaire wants to be a decamillionaire. The guy who's a decamillionaire wants to be a billionaire. So your customers will always come back and they'll always deal with you because no one's ever got to like, oh, I've got $100 billion, I'm going to stop now, right? Uh, whereas if you've got 1,000 properties, you probably stop. So that was his advice to me. So I, I started learning as much as I could about the stock market and then educating other people, educating clients and, and working with them. And yeah, it was, it was literally a conversation. Um, actually, a friend, a friend of mine who was a financial planner, he introduced me to Bitcoin in 2012 um, when it was like brand new, fresh off the boat. Uh, I think it was, it was only a few dollars per coin. Uh, might have been like $20 or something like that. And he said, oh, you're a financial planner. You're a smart guy. You'll understand this. Have a look at this Bitcoin thing. And I looked at it and I read the paper and I didn't understand. It didn't make any sense to me. And because I couldn't figure it out in 20 seconds, I just said, no, it's not for me. And then it was 2015 when I was literally complaining to a friend of mine that some of the people that we pay, some of the subcontractors, 
don't have a bank account. And when you've got to drive to you know, the Western Union office and hand over cash and pay $70 to send cash to Indonesia or Africa, and then the guy has to drive to the Western Union office and show his driver's license or his passport and get the cash, it's a slow process. It's an expensive process. And my friend just went, I'll oh, just use Bitcoin. I said, yeah, I've heard of Bitcoin. What is it? And he said, it's money you can email. And I went, oh, I understand that now. Yeah. <laughs> when the bank is shut, I can still send an email. Um, and I looked at it and went, oh, it's volatile because the price goes up and down, up and down. But he said, you know, if you're sending someone money at nine o'clock in the morning and they cash it out at 10 o'clock, you don't worry about the volatility. Mm. If they're just using it for a payment, you don't worry about the volatility. Um, you know, gold is volatile over time. Silver is volatile over time. But if you're not hanging on to it for too long, it doesn't matter about it. And if you are hanging on to it for longer periods, you hang on to it for five or six years and the ups and downs don't matter so much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, we always hear it's this volatility argument. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I was just going to ask why invest? I think the question why invest in cryptocurrency is different from the question of why invest in Bitcoin. Am I correct on that one? Um, that's a that's a good question. I'm going to puzzle on that. No one's asked me that before. Yeah. Um, it, it, Bitcoin is a security. It's a, not a security. It's a safe haven, yeah. a store of value, and a payment system. Um, you can't play Pac-Man on it, right? Um, Same way. Not that you'd ever want to, but someone has actually made uh, different cryptocurrencies and different blockchain networks mm -hmm. because it's like the internet, right? You know, when things start to get digitized, like Taylor Swift's new album is digital. You can listen to it on SoundCloud or Spotify or whatever. You don't normally go out and buy a CD anymore. Everything's becoming digital. Movies are digital. We don't go to the DVD store, the Blockbuster video anymore. So the currencies have become digital and people are preserving things on the blockchain in the currency. So, you know, old games like Galaga and Pac-Man and things like that, they could put onto the blockchain. So it's always going to be there. You know, in 100 years time, you won't be able to find an old Sega Genesis Master System or whatever, um, but you'll be able to play these games and preserving knowledge, preserving old books and things like that. So there's, there's so many different uses. And that's, that's again, why I liken it to the stock market, but on, on steroids. You know, it's mm -hmm. very high tech. And there's new uses that we're discovering for blockchain every day. Um, there are industries out there like stock exchanges, um, medical systems, and record keeping sensitive data where they can store it on the blockchain and have it secured. Um, I think, you know, you're, you're a young bloke. If you try to get into a nightclub, they're going to ask you for ID, right? And the bouncer looks at your ID, which normally shows your name, your date of birth, you know, your home address, everything. And, you know, if you're, a, you're an attractive young person, you don't want the bouncer knowing where you live. Really, you just need to show them the date of birth part and the photo. Mm -hmm. So for privacy, privacy protection, you can have your medical records and your personal records stored on the blockchain, but you can only show the relevant parts. If you're going to the fit, fit doctor, they don't need to know about your mental illness. Mm -hmm. you know? They don't need to know where your parents grew up or whether your parents are still married or any of that sort of stuff. You can protect your information. It can be stored forever and it can be controlled by you. There's so many applications and more applications coming out all the time, which is, which is really exciting. It, it really is like the early days when the internet was first invented. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, when the internet was first invented, there was just like static pages. Like there was a Nike page that showed a pair of shoes. Yeah. Um, you know, there was no there was no email. <laughs> it's just like these these little websites, um, and 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 chat things. You could chat to other people on a, on a chat board, but you couldn't actually send them a direct message. And then someone's like, "Hey, I wonder if we can put a picture on the internet." And all of a sudden, there's photos everywhere. And someone says, "I wonder if we can put a video on the internet." And then you could watch a little you know thirty second dancing baby on the internet. And now we're having you know, hours long digital discussions all over the world. And there's always new applications coming out that we never dreamed possible before. And cryptocurrency is just one of those things where we can use the internet and the connections between these computers to bypass the banking system. We don't need the banking system anymore. And it's either going to adapt like the postal service did, or it's going to disappear. So cryptocurrency is kind of an application that 
utilizes blockchain technology, but blockchain, it's not like it's a blockchain is independent of cryptocurrency. And, and one of the things is that, and I can accept that I'm just, a, I'm terrible ex at explaining the blockchain, but I've tried to explain it to like three different people and they have no clue what I'm talking about. They tap out after three minutes. So what is the blockchain? Like, I guess from a high level, how does it work and why is it important? The blockchain is like to use a very old analogy. It's like railway tracks, okay. right? You know, you, you can jump on a train in Russia and, you know, you can go overland and you'll end up in Spain or Brazil or whatever. I don't know geography very well. Um, but obviously when they were building the railways back in those 1800 days, um, you know, the railway in Russia might have been this wide and the railway in Spain might have been this wide. So you'd have to change trains because the tracks were different. You know, and even, even when the internet was first invented way, way back, you know, 60s and 70s, I'm talking, you could get an Apple computer. And if I had an Apple computer and you had an Apple computer, we could communicate with each other over the internet. Um, but the, the, the Microsoft computers couldn't talk to the Apples. You know, they could only talk to each other. So you had to have exactly the same configuration as the other person. And what really revolutionized it is when they actually brought in the, the universal system and just said, okay, now everybody can talk to everybody. It doesn't matter whether you've got a Linux system, or whether you've got this or whether you've got that. Um, it's like if they brought in, you know, a blockchain that everybody could talk to, then what we have blockchain agnostic systems. Because right now, Bitcoin can't actually talk to the Ethereum network. It's a different network. Mm. But people are bringing in new applications like wrapped Bitcoin that can run on Ethereum. Um, and there's, there's coins like Chainlink and Thorchain and uh, Pith and a, a couple of other ones that are actually making it possible to send a transaction. Because Bitcoin is great for payments. Um, Ethereum is great for smart contracts, mm -hmm. um, like real estate contracts and things like that, agreements that can be settled instantly. Um, so you need those systems to be able to talk to each other. So it's, it's still evolving. Like the blockchain mm -hmm. is basically the, the internet, the crypto is the applications that run on it. And right. we're still sort of figuring out how to actually make these more accessible, more user friendly. It's going to take a while. But, you know, as I say, the first, first web pages came out 25, 30 years ago. And then it was a long time before we had, you know, YouTube, before we had Facebook. And Facebook came out almost 20 years after the internet was invented. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit primitive. Um, it's only been going 15 years. It's not like the stock market, which has been going for 300 years. Wow. But it's getting there very, very fast because it's using technology. And there's people from all around the world who could work on it all at the same time. So do NFTs have any part place in this conversation? Do you take those seriously? I feel like whenever we talk about NFTs, we're just like, they're a scam, they're this, they're that. But uh, do they have any purpose or utilization? I heard people talking about NFTs for medical records, for gaming. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously NFTs can be used for, you know, art artwork. Should we be taking NFTs seriously? Um, it's, 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 it's been a while since I've been into a store and seen a poster. Mm. Um, but like when I, when I was a uni student, you'd walk into a store and there's like a Nirvana poster or a Blues Brothers movie poster or, you know, whatever it happens to be. And I would buy these posters for like $5 and you stick them on your wall with blue tack and that's what you do. Um, but... You, you don't think I'm going to sell that artwork to somebody else, right? It's not like it's a Monet. It's not like the Mona Lisa. It's not going to increase in value. It's mm -hmm. a simple mass produced, almost worthless piece of stuff. Um, and most NFTs are like that. I mean, Beeple sold his, his NFT for $69 million. Oh my God. But that was an artwork. That was something that someone had poured like five or six years of their life into taking all of those photos. Um, so yeah, that, that definitely had some value. Like if you painted an oil painting that took you five years to complete, that's going to have some value. But if I took a photo of that oil painting and then just printed a thousand copies, then those things don't have any value. And most NFTs, like the bored apes and the the zombies and all those things, they all look pretty much the same except for some tiny little differences. 
Yeah. And they're essentially worthless. There are some NFTs that can be valuable. Um, I think Snoop Dogg put out an NFT that you actually paid for the NFT um, and you got an unreleased album. So no one else can listen to the album. It's not on Spotify. It's not available in the stores, but you could listen to the exclusive songs that only you could hear, you and mm. 300 other people. And then while ever you hold that NFT, you could get front row tickets to his concerts for mm. as long as he was alive and performing. So that thing, if you're a Snoop Dogg fan, that was extremely valuable to those people. And the fact there was only a couple of hundred of them, that actually made it valuable. But when they just do these mass-produced generated art, no. It's, if you like it, sure, buy it. But don't assume that you're going to be able to sell it to somebody else. Like I didn't sell my Blues Brothers poster. I've still got my Arnold Schwarzenegger Commando poster that I bought in <laughs> 1988 or something. Um, I've still got that. But I'm, I'm not under any illusion I'm going to sell it to someone else. So, so the people who want to make money, yeah, maybe artwork's not the way to go because it's very, very niche. Um, I, you know, if, I, if I wanted to sell my Snoop Dogg thing, I could only sell it to people who like Snoop Dogg. Whereas if I wanted to sell a Bitcoin, I could sell a Bitcoin in any country in the world. I know we're deep in the weeds here, but I just had a thought that I have to ask. So we're... Yeah. we're, we're hearing a lot and reading a lot of articles about how uh, generative AI is infringing on creator content. They're just stealing, you know, creators works and creators are suing, but you know, those court cases are TBD. Can NFTs help or solve this? If I'm a creator, can I just upload my artwork or my music as an NFT collect royalties and also not have AI scrape my my work and you know use it for free like is this am I just thinking out loud um I, I don't think that's possible like if, no? if you took a picture of yourself and you upload it to Facebook I mean I, I still get it I've been on Facebook since 2007 so that's a bloody long time um and I still get the occasional friend who types in their box I do not give Facebook permission to use my photos blah 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 I'm like Phew. You agreed to the terms and conditions, right? The only way to protect your privacy is to delete your Facebook account. And even then, they will still store your photos and your posts for seven years just in case there's a legal issue down the track. Um, so once you put something on the internet, anybody can copy it. Like these, these people who buy the NFT for a million dollars, Justin Bieber, and then put it as their profile on Twitter. Well, guess what? I can right-click that and I can go right-click, save as. And all of a sudden, I've got the NFT. <laughs> I've got the same picture. Um, I can't prove ownership of it, but I can copy it a million times. And anybody can do that. Any photo, anything you put on the internet can be copied a million times. And even if AI just disappeared tomorrow, if Skynet got beaten, um, then there'd just be human beings. It'd be human beings saving this picture and going, oh, look at that Irish bloke. He's a really hot looking bloke. I'm going to save his picture and put it on my bedroom wall, right? People can do that. There'd be thousands of pictures of you right now that you don't even know about. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> um, just Did people copy music, like all, all the songs that yeah. became MP3s on Napster and that sort of stuff. You can't stop the piracy. True. Um, but yeah, there's there's really not a lot you can do about it because we are all connected. In the olden days, before Napster, we used to record songs off the radio with a tape recorder. All right. Mm. There's, there's still little MP3 devices where you can record songs off the FM radio. So you, you're never going to stop that. Um, but I guess, you know, all you can do is say embrace the future and say, I'm not going to invest in post office stocks, right? Sure. I'm going to invest in technology stocks because that's where everybody's heading. And if people are going to pirate my, my movies or my music or whatever, the best way for me to make a little bit of money back is to invest in the technology that's allowing them to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to have such a Lex Friedman transition right now. So we're talking about pirates, pirates like gold, speaking of digital gold, meaning Bitcoin. Um, so we were talking about BlackRock, BlackRock getting into Bitcoin, um, as it were. How is BlackRock going to drive that price? And how does this relate to the stock market in the sense of when institutions got into the stock market, they started driving the price. So, so maybe 
how how does BlackRock getting into Bitcoin change the way Bitcoin works for the future? Great question. Great question. So going back into history again, um, stock market's been around since 1602 or something like that. Uh, but even in, in the 1950s, 1960s, like there's very, very few people who actually had stocks because you know, you have to have a broker. You have to go and sit in the broker's office and you have to say, you know, I want to buy stocks and shares in whatever company. And you'd say, okay, it's a $10,000 minimum. And you've got to front up $10,000, which back then was a fortune. Mm -hmm. um, and then to diversify your portfolio, you've got to have, you know, five or 10 different stocks. So it was only the very wealthiest 1% of the population who could actually afford to buy stocks. Um, 1971, Jack Bogle from Vanguard said, I want to make this thing where anybody can buy stocks. Anybody can put $1,000 in and get a balanced portfolio because he was going to pool all the money together in a big bucket and everybody puts in $1,000, all of a sudden he's got a million bucks. He can go out and buy all these different stocks and have a diversified portfolio. And at the time, the stockbroker said to Jack Bogle, you're an idiot. No one's going to do that. That's ridiculous. And after 12 months, I think he had like five customers. Mm -hmm. And the next year he had about 12 customers. And then the third year, it kind of exploded when people realized, oh, my God, I can actually invest like the top richest 1% of the world with only a thousand bucks. And obviously, you know, Jack Bogle's S&P 500 fund was the first mutual fund in the world. But since then, you know, we've got Vanguard, we've got BlackRock, we've got all these other guys who are literally trillion dollar companies, multi-trillion dollar companies, because people want to invest safely and simply. And you know, even, even now, if you wanted to buy some Bitcoin, you'd have to get a wallet. You'd have to have a 12-word seed phrase. You might need a password. You might need this. You might need your, your driver's license or your passport for KYC. It's all very, very complicated. And it's always been complicated if you want to hold your own currency. Um, but what BlackRock has done is basically done the same thing. They've just done a big pool where you can just go there, open an account as easy as you open a Robin Hood account, and buy five dollars worth of stock in Tesla. You know, Tesla stock isn't five dollars, but you can buy a, a small part of a Tesla stock if you wanted to. So these discount brokers and online brokers, again, the internet has revolutionised everything, where people can actually access these things. So, you know, BlackRock is just individual investors all pulled together who can now buy Bitcoin as easily as they would buy a stock just by clicking a couple of buttons on their screen, whereas for the old school people, they had to have the passphrases and the wallets and the, all the backup and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it's made things a lot easier, uh, which is great for mass adoption. And again, I'd compare it to the, the early days of the internet. The, the old days of the internet were hard. Mm -hmm. You had to have a modem. You had to plug it in. You had to get people off the phone line. You had to you know, set up the TCP, ICP settings and things like that. And there was no Google. There was no search engines. You had to know where you were going and type in <laughs> the address yeah which wasn't an easy to remember URL. It was just a bunch of numbers. So now, you know, BlackRock and these guys have made it so much easier to get into stocks, to get into cryptocurrency. And it's really a massive option. This is where you know, all the rest of the people pile in and the price, of course, does go up. So just one, one more thing I'll say is you know, gold, even gold. We've had it for 6,000 years, but to buy gold, you have to go to the gold broker. You have to hand over your cash and you get a little gold bar. In, when was it, 1994, someone correct me, 2000, somewhere around that. Only, only recently, they actually made a gold-backed stock, right, and an and EFT. So, sorry, ETF. Um, people could actually buy gold just by clicking on a button. They get a little mm -hmm. piece of paper saying, you now own one bar of gold. When that happened, when people could buy gold as easily as buying stocks, the price tripled. Mm. Right? And it's never gone back down. And now people can buy crypto as easily as clicking two buttons. The price is going to move. It just has to. So should we be looking at BlackRock getting into Bitcoin and crypto in general with starry eyes? Or should we have some hesitancy? Because, you know, beforehand, a millionaire could get into Bitcoin and cause a massive spike. Now you have to be the richest guy in the world, Elon Musk to get into Bitcoin and then dump a lot of it and make it super volatile. Eventually you'll have to be the richest country. But when we're looking at BlackRock and I, I forget the article, but I think 
BlackRock, Vanguard, and maybe another corporation own like 80% of, of, of the, the, the Fortune 500 companies or something or have like massive, you know, stakes. Yeah. Yeah. And so is BlackRock going to alter the decentralization of Bitcoin? Is, is it, are they going to hold unprecedented power and control the network in maybe um, unproductive ways? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's really a double-edged sword because, mm -hmm. as you say, you know, the, 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 the big players can move the market. Um, and you know, every, everybody who's, who's been holding cryptocurrency for the last few years has been very excited about the institutions coming in and bringing their trillions of dollars, right, which is going right. to rising tide floats all boats. Um, but what we've always cautioned people is with the institutional money comes institutional behaviour. And oh, these nice. guys, like if you listen to the, the fund managers, even from you know, a few years ago, before there was cryptocurrency, when there were stocks, and they'd be interviewing Jamie Dimon or someone on the, on the news, and he'd be saying, oh, no, 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 yeah, we don't like China. China's really bad, blah, 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 blah. Um, meanwhile, he's actually investing in China. But mm -hmm. he didn't want to tell people he's investing in China because otherwise they'd go out and buy it and the price would go up. He wanted mm -hmm. to downplay it so people thought he wasn't, and then he could buy it cheaper. So that's institutional behavior. And you know, they can do things like manipulating the market, and they can actually flat out lie. And I'll just say they're protecting their intellectual property. <laughs> um, so yeah, they can, they can manipulate the market. I don't, think, I don't think BlackRock would actually centralize too much because there's a lot of these nerdy geeky people who got in when bitcoin was a dollar and two dollars and three dollars and some of these guys might be holding you know a couple of hundred thousand bitcoin not a couple mm -hmm. hundred thousand dollars but a couple of hundred thousand bitcoin right. right the satoshi wallet has a million bitcoin just sitting in his his wallet right so i think you have to you have to look at they can they can bid the price up but if there's not enough to go around people might just hang on to it and if you think the price is going to go up, you'll hang on to it even tighter and they can bid the price up and up and up. I mean, I, I know, you know, when I first got into Bitcoin, it was under $1,000. And then when the price went to $20,000, I went, oh, this is nice. And I right. became a little bit more generous and I gave some Bitcoin to my mum and I gave some Bitcoin to a few of my friends. Right. Um, but I didn't sell it all out and I held on and then it got up to like sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. And I was like, oh, I might go and you know, put a coat of paint on my car and change it a different color or something like that. But I wasn't right. going to sell out the whole lot. And there's people now who are saying, well, I'm not going to sell even if it's a million dollars. I might take a little bit of profit, but I'm not going to sell. I'm going to hold on because they think it's going to go up and increase in value over time as you know, gold and silver and diamonds and, and anything that's super scarce and super rare will always go up in value over time. So I, I, I think BlackRock can bid the price up but I don't think they'll get it from the people who have been holding it for literally years and years and years. And they've held it, you know, from when it went from $60,000, $60, it crashed down to like $5,000 and they still mm -hmm. held on. And then it went up again and they still held on. So it, it'd be interesting. I, I can't predict the future, sure. um, but I think there's going to be a lot of people who just hang on and on and on and say, you know, I'll keep it for my grandchildren. Yeah. Oh, we should make sure we say this this podcast is not financial advice okay let's just let's just keep it Absolutely. safe um it's i guess building on specific and blah 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 exactly yeah. now, i guess is. building off of that so a lot of gen z are seeing folks you know invest five dollars in cryptocurrency one night and be a millionaire the next day and buy a lamborghini and they look at this with you know fascination and intrigue what do you tell Gen Z who maybe want to get into cryptocurrency? How do they approach this technology and industry in a healthy way? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who say, you know, oh, a friend of my cousin's next door neighbor's sister-in-law's tea lady put $5 in and made a million bucks. Mm -hmm. But you never actually hear the person's name. Like you can't verify that story. So I think it's, it's, it's a made up story, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've never personally met anybody. I've, I've been in the industry a long time. I've never personally met anybody who put in $5 and made a million. Um, having said that, you know, in nine years of running our fund, 
we do research, we check things, we get into projects, we make sure they're actually verified. Um, we've made returns of more than 10,000% six different times, mm. right? We bought something when it was like one or two cents and then it goes up to like $200. We've done that six different times. We can verify it. It's all on the blockchain. We can show you the trades. Um, so those people who say, yeah, yeah, I got into Pepe when it was this price and I sold it, probably not, unless they can actually show you proof. Don't believe them. Um, and those, those meme coins that do nothing, you know, they're worth one cent, then they're worth $100, then they're worth nothing again. But you see, they all go up and, and go straight back down. Mm -hmm. But you've got to look at, at, you know, projects that actually do something, ones that add value. So sensible investing, again, like people say, oh, if you invested a dollar in Microsoft back on the day you were born or a dollar in Amazon on the day you were born, you'd be a multimillionaire. And that's true because Microsoft actually does stuff. It sells yeah. product. Amazon does stuff, creates services and things like that. So, yeah, check. We, we have a whole a whole discussion on the Krillionaire page, which is our not-for-profit organisation. We just provide free education because there's so many scams. 92.5% of cryptocurrencies are scams, oh, wow. right? So you're much more likely to lose your money than you are to literally win the lottery on that, you know, putting $5 in and buying a yeah. uh, you Let's, let's touch more on that. How do you define scams? Um, ones that have rug pulls, ones that uh, they, they might make, say, a million tokens mm -hmm. and they'll release 200,000 of them and they'll keep 800,000 for themselves. And then everyone gets excited and starts buying this token and the price goes up and up and up. And then the person who's holding the 800,000 will just dump all theirs and they'll sell all a lot when it's at the top of the market. So there's scams, there's rug pulls. Like Squid Game coin was one that came out when Squid Game was really popular a few years ago on the TV. Mm -hmm. Someone created a Squid Game coin and it had in the programming that you could actually buy it. You could put $1,000 in, but you could never take your money out. Mm -hmm. Only the person who created it could take the money out. So it literally scammed millions of people. And it was just a clever name. It didn't actually do anything. It didn't add any value. So that, that's what we teach people on, on the Krillionet page is, you know, look for, look for the offering, what it actually does. Um, because over time, you know, Microsoft is still in business 30, 40 years later. Um, and a lot of these companies are still in business, you know, 50 or 100 years later because they add value. They do something. They're not just fly-by-night sort of, Oh, that's a funny name. I think I'm going to call it Pepe or, mm -hmm. you know, Dogecoin. Dogecoin does nothing. doesn't do anything. You know, yeah. Elon might like the cute dog, but at the end of the day, it doesn't do anything. And every year there's millions and millions of more Dogecoin created. So it's like just photocopying paper, you know, photocopying, photocopying, photocopying. It becomes worthless. It's like when they're printing, printing currency, like they printed all the stimulus money during the pandemic and the dollar became devalued by between 30 and 50%. Because they've printed more dollars. So, yeah, do your homework. Don't yes. invest willy nilly. <laughs> um, study study the, the coin method that we have. It's a four step process. It literally takes less than five minutes to research and make sure you're not giving your money to a Russian scammer. Um, and I'm not being racist. Three of the last scams I've looked at were all stinking by the same Russians because Putin's running out of money mm -hmm. um, and they need to scam people in America. Because yeah. no one in America can, can willingly send money through the banking system to Russia while the war's going on. Um, so they've started all these scams and you can you can check into them because we've got Google, we've got the blockchain, we've got different things where you can actually look at who started this website, when did they start it, what country did they register the website in, recognize the, the URL and the IP address. Like I, I was contacted by a guy on LinkedIn, oh yeah, we've been in business for six years, we've got this blockchain technology, they wanted our company to invest in their company. Mm -hmm. And I did like literally 60 seconds of checking and his website was only registered eight months ago. Now, <laughs> how could you be in business for six years if you only just yeah. started up your website, right? It's a scam. Mm -hmm. So I just like, took me less than 60 seconds. I move on, check out the next project. So yeah, don't, don't fall for the hype because you never, you never meet the person who made millions. Yes. So it's probably an urban, urban myth. Um, but yeah, do your research and you can actually talk to people who have done more realistic gains of, you know, a thousand percent or 10,000%. I think our record was 13,000%.
you know, that's that's the best that we did. Yeah. Um, and again, we just we took profits from that because I didn't know it might go up to twenty thousand percent. I don't know. But when it gets up that high, you start to sell off a little bit, sell off a little bit, and take your profits. You because you don't want to wait for the peak because the peak might be too late. It might be the crash the next day. You don't know. Some of these projects have crashed by literally ninety nine percent. So yeah the the crashes are what is giving a lot of people a bad t taste in their mouth when it comes to crypto the terra yeah. luna one and the ftx one specifically uh with sam bankman freed uh, everybody that i've talked to has, has commented on that and said i'm not interested in crypto anymore so just i guess touching on that how do we take away this bad feeling or hesitancy from people of investing in crypto when we've had these recent qu crashes yeah, I, I would say um, a few years ago we had Enron and WorldCom um, that went spectacularly broke and they mm. were on the stock market. They were on the NASDAQ, right? Um, if you want to see a great documentary on that crash, it's a Jim Carrey movie called Fun with Dick and Jane. Um, very funny. But the company was just doing all this monstrous lying um, and it cost investors billions and billions of dollars. More recently, we had Elizabeth Holmes with, um, what's her blood transfusion company? Theranos. Yeah, yeah. Theranos. Like, and that's only in the last couple of years. It took billions and billions of dollars. So if you see, okay, Enron, WorldCom, Theranos, OneTel, whatever, do you just go, oh, I'm not investing in the stock market ever again? Or do you say... I'm going to invest in the stock market, but I'll do my due diligence. You know, I'll invest in Amazon because I know Jeff Bezos. I know what he looks like. I know what he sells. Yep. You don't stop investing. In, like you've had one bad date and you're going to give up on, on girlfriends forever. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> you won't write off all of crypto just because you've had one or two bad cryptos. Right. You know, so. Yeah, no, it's important. It's important for, for people to hear. Um, especially Gen Z, which brings me to my last question, which is maybe outside of cryptocurrency, what advice do you have for Gen Z? Invest. Start now, um, even if you've only got five bucks. And, you know, just it's, it's very, very simple. I mean, people go, oh, my God, it's so complicated and there's so many billions of stocks and so many thousands of cryptocurrencies and things like that. And the advice that I started giving you know, 20, 30 years ago when I wrote my first book was look at where you're spending your money. If you're giving money every month to your phone company, to your electricity company, to your car insurance company, wherever your money is going, wherever you're spending your money, it's probably a decent company because you like them and I'm sure a few of your friends like them. So they're probably still going to be in business in a couple of years' time. And you can buy stock in that company that you already know and love for just a couple of dollars using a discount broker. Mm -hmm. and, and let's say, for example, you know, you might be with Vodafone. Not that there's anything wrong with that or not that there's anything good about them. But if you're with them and you keep paying them every month, you can invest in a couple of shares in that. And then maybe a couple of years later, someone comes out with a better deal and you go, I don't like Vodafone anymore. I like XYZ company. You can sell your stock in Vodafone and you can buy shares in the new XYZ. Like... I used to invest in Blockbuster Video. I used to invest in Nokia mobile phones, right? Because they were the best mm -hmm. back in the 90s. But then when everybody started buying the iPhone and getting rid of their Nokias, everybody started using Netflix instead of Blockbuster, I changed my investments. Because wherever your dollars are going is probably a good place to invest into. And it will change over time. Right. Yeah. So right. that's very, very simple. Invest where you spend. Write those words down and do it okay hold on let me just write it down for a second well <laughs> jeremy this is yeah, a I, I just fantastic saved conversation book. The book's really like, where is it there we go it's uh it's 240 pages long but the ultimate message is invest where you spend invest and where you spend will change over time we'll put the link to the book in the show notes along with boston trading and Krillionaire, right the nonprofit. Yes. Yep. oh where, where can we find you on social media um, um Search for Boston Coin. Um, we're on we're on Twitter and Facebook and whatever the other one is, Instagram. Um, <laughs> yeah, Boston, BostonTrading.co is the easiest place to start because that'll have a link to our socials. Uh, sorry, kids, we don't do TikTok 
Uh, we barely do Telegram and we don't do Discord, uh, mostly because there's a lot of scams on those platforms. Yeah. Like YouTube will actually verify things and if it's false information, they'll take it down. Yeah. Uh, whereas a lot of these other platforms don't. We like to be fully transparent. So if you go mm -hmm. onto our website right now, you can actually see exactly what we're invested into, like the 30, 40 different coins, the ratios of them. That's updated on the hour every hour. 99.9% .9 of companies won't do that. As I say, a lot of fund managers will actually lie about where they're going to invest or where they're investing to try and manipulate the price. Mm -hmm. We have decided to be ethical. <laughs> That's just the path we've decided to follow and think that'll be long-term profitability rather than short-term market manipulation. And that's what we want to be known for. So yeah, bostontrading.co, check it out, check out the portfolio page, check out the team, get in contact, say hi. And you know, if, you, if you've got a decent amount of money that you want us to look after, obviously we can do that. But if you've got a little bit of money and you just want to do it safely and avoid all the scams, then head on over to the Krillionaire page. But literally, you know, in, in nine years, we've done thousands and thousands and thousands of trades into different cryptocurrencies. Um, and yeah, we made 10,000% made a few times. But also the most important thing, I in all that time, we never had a single coin go to zero. We've mm. never had a scam. We've never had a rug pull. We've never given our money to a, a dodgy Russian mafia type you know, because we did the homework. And we teach people how to do the homework because if you can't afford our services, that's okay. The least we can do is teach you how to do it safely so no one's going to rip you off. Right. Get into well, the crypto, get into the stock market. Don't be afraid because of the bad stories. Otherwise, you'd never get into a plane or you'd never get into a car, right? People only tell you the bad stories, but just do a little bit of research first. Right. Do the homework and this type of homework will save you money. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jeremy, Invest thanks for this now, conversation. Don't understand it. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a fantastic conversation and thank you for your time. Thank you.